you so much for having me today here. Uh, perhaps I will quickly show my screen. One second. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint? Is it clear to everyone? Yeah, it's yes. very clear. Yes, thank you. So today's talk is really about um, how we can create a translanguaging space for promoting social inclusion and justice in linguistically and culturally diverse classrooms. Um, I'm aware that uh, last time you have um, assistant professor Zhong Fengtian to talk about translanguaging as well. So perhaps I, will, uh, I won't describe too much about what translanguaging means, but I will quickly define it for those who don't I haven't heard of the term or, doesn't, or don't really understand the meaning of it. So as our society increasingly becomes linguistically and culturally diverse, there is a need for our teachers to develop students' communicative competence so that students can articulate their thoughts in their own ways and also expand their worldviews. Despite the multilingual reality of the world, a lot of schools continue to insist on monolingual academic standard practices, such as adopting English as the medium of instruction. Some teachers and parents often feel that one language only, or one language at a time, is the best way to maximize the input of English in learning and to avoid transfer from the first languages, which can only be negative and trigger errors in the target language. However, we should remind ourselves that classroom learning is by definition limited and superficial. Therefore, a great deal of learning actually happens outside of the classroom, where translanguaging is a common practice for speakers to make themselves understood and share their realities. So that is why translanguaging is important um, and how we can bring that into the classroom is a core as a core issue that we need to consider. So translanguaging is an emerging concept in the field of multilingual education. And it refers to practices that allows teachers and students to use their full linguistic and multimodal resources to support meaning making processes. In other words, translanguaging advocates a, pers a perspective that languages that students already know, either as their first language or parallel languages, should and can play an important role in learning additional languages. Um, so as you can see on the screen, that's the um, broad definition of what translanguaging means. So translanguaging is a process of knowledge construction, which goes beyond different linguistic structures and systems. In other words, not only different languages and dialects, but also different ways of speaking. It also involves going beyond different modalities, such as switching between communicative modes, uh, such as, as speaking and writing, and coordinating gestures, different body movements, facial expressions, facial images, um, etc., to facilitate that process of creating new knowledge. So translanguaging has been seen as transformative in nature, and uh, Li Wei actually comes up with a term called translanguaging space, and that means bringing together different sociocultural factors, such as personal history, our environment, our attitudes, beliefs, and ideology into one coordinated and meaningful performance. So in other words, translanguaging practices are complex in nature because there are different factors that play a role in influencing an individual's use of meaning-making resources in the process of constructing knowledge. So such a perspective of language really reconceptualized language as multilingual, a multimodal, multisensory, and multisemiotic system of meaning-making resource. So let's take a look of an example of what translanguaging looks like in everyday life practice. So this is an example of a very simple sign. Um, but this sign 
it involves a much more complex translanguaging process, precisely because the amount of traditional language script is reduced. Um, one needs to know the flag of Hong Kong in order to understand the sign. So as we can see, we are all living in a translanguaging world, and that is the sociolinguistic reality that we are living in everyday life. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, um, are we going to bring that into the classroom? Um, that's, that's an important question to consider because the focus here is not about having a particular named language that we should adopt as the school medium of instruction because it divorces from the sociolinguistic reality of our students in their everyday life. So translanguaging pedagogy, um, as I mentioned, is not just about allowing students to use their first languages in the classroom. Um, it aims to maximize that the students' bilingual um, learning potential by making good use of their awareness and knowledge of different languages. The goal of translanguaging is about respecting diverse linguistic and multimodal practices as key resources in knowledge construction. Therefore, translanguaging um, encourages us to challenge and resist monolingual policies and also challenge the racial linguistic ideologies that promote native speaker norms and compare multilingual students to their monolingual English speaking counterparts. You know, this leads to a challenge for multilingual education, which is the need for more professional development opportunities for teachers to develop their competence in implementing translanguaging pedagogy in their classrooms. A recent paper by Professor Li Wei actually argues that um, translanguaging can be used, uh, can be seen as a pedagogy for inclusion and social justice. And that can be achieved through um, a process called co-learning and bringing funds of knowledge into the classroom space. So the idea of funds of knowledge um, it's actually proposed by educational researchers by Mo et al. back in 1992. It refers to the historically accumulated and culturally developed bodies of knowledge and skills, essentials for households and individual functioning and well-being. So here, this definition, it was, you may feel like it's a bit more spe um, specific. At that time, the, Scott, the, the researchers, they were entering their, stu um, their students' um, household, and they realized that the students actually know so much outside of the classroom. So they were thinking whether they can bring in the students' understanding that, that the student knowledge that they've acquired from the households um, into the classroom. So such funds of knowledge contained a rich and co rich cultural and cognitive resources that can be used in the classroom in order to provide uh, culturally responsive, meaningful and effective teaching. In other words, our teachers can explore ways of including, enabling and empowering their students, not just through mobilizing different linguistic and multimodal resources that they know, but also mobilizing other aspects of their lived experience, their other funds of knowledge. So, the idea of translanguaging, as we have just covered, it can be seen as a theory of language. It can also be seen as a pedagogy. Um, the third way of understanding translanguaging is um, perceiving it as an analytical perspective or as a methodological perspective. So adopting the translanguaging perspective encourages us as researchers to examine the linguistic innovation and change um, indicated by multilinguals. In other words, it's to capture how individuals make good use of the affordances of various resources creatively to transcend the standards of the named languages and the sociocultural norms. This methodological approach allows researchers to go beyond from um, doing structural analysis for identifying the 
frequent and regular patterns. This redirects the researchers in focusing on how language uses break boundaries between named languages and non-linguistic semiotic systems in particular moments of the social interaction. So now I will provide, <coughs> sorry, I will provide uh, two examples in this presentation. So the first example comes from first grade English as a first language classroom in the United States. And the second example is a year two ESL classroom in Hong Kong. So perhaps let's focus on the first example that comes from uh, English, uh, English as a first language classroom in the United States. So research on multilingual education or second language education has already explored um, the impact of translanguaging practices on uh, second language classrooms, how translanguaging can be used as pedagogical practices to bring equitable education for emergent multilingual students and facilitate their student participation. But research on the construction of a translanguaging space in English as a first language classroom remain limited. I think it's important to um, understand the differences. In English as a first language classroom, the goal is to develop native English speaking students' um, English literacy skills and also develop their appreciation of literature in different genres. Whereas in English as a second language classroom, student, uh, the goal is to develop students' abilities in using English um, to communicate effectively. So if you think about that, you won't really expect the use of translanguaging in English as a first language classroom, because it is assumed that all participants, including teachers and students, you know, all participants in the classroom, they all share the same L1, which is English. Therefore, the switching between named languages is not ne necessary to facilitate meaning making processes. But researchers, you know, in our field of multilingualism and translanguaging research will be arguing that translanguaging does not only promote students' appreciation of cultural and linguistic diversity in the world. It can potentially allow native English speaking students to develop their understanding of the world. So this study focuses on how L1 first language English teacher can utilize a variety of multilingual and multimodal resources to diversify the communicative abilities of native English speaking students and to promote their appreciation of linguistic and cultural diversity in contemporary society. It is because of all these reasons, it's important to look at how uh, teachers implement translanguaging in first language setting. So I've covered that and um, let's move on to the context of the school. So the study actually took place in a first grade classroom in, in USA and as you can see a lot most of 87 percent of the students were identified as white, eight percent as Hispanic, 4% uh, as Black and or African American, and 1% as, as Asian. Within the school, 98.6% uh, of the students speak English as their first language, while 1.4% of them speak another language. The school offers a Spanish class for students, but it's part of the extracurriculum. Um, so it's kind of like the extra classes that they can take. And it's optional. And in this particular classroom, there are 18 students in the class. They are all born and raised in the US and they're all, they all spoke English as the first language. And in this particular lesson, they are focusing on a unit which, which is about holidays and cultures around the world. The teacher in this example, um, she's a native speaker of English. She, briefly, she studied Spanish at high school and 
when we were studying her, she was working as a full-time teacher. And then she recent she completed a master's degree program in education with an ESL specialism. And she took a bilingual education course with a focus on translanguaging. So the course was actually taught by my second author. In that particular course, um, they, the students learned about um, the meaning and purposes of translanguaging and, and how to develop their pedagogical translanguaging knowledge um, and the way they can create a lesson plan that can reflect their understanding of translanguaging. They also did a 15 hour teaching practicum at a local school district. But um, as I have briefly mentioned, you know, teachers, in English as a first language class, they are not really expected to translanguage. So that is why it makes it very interesting. So we collected some video uh, data and also we did follow up um, interview with the teacher. Specifically, we did video stimulated recall interview. In terms of research method, we combined the two methodologies come together. It's a unique approach in understanding the complexity of translanguaging practices in social interaction. So multimodal conversation analysis, it, it is a sociological methodology. It comes from sociology, which adopts a participant relevant perspective to explore how participants achieve different social actions through interactions without pre-theorizing the relevance and importance of language in use, which includes semiotic resources such as gestures. But I have briefly explained the definition of translanguaging space before. Um, we know that translanguaging practices are complex in nature. There are different sociocultural factors such as personal history, identity and beliefs uh, can play a role in shaping the participants translanguaging practices. But conversation analysis as a methodology, it really only focusing on uh, what is publicly displayed in the social interaction, not what is privately thought or felt by the participants. It only aims to document the resources that speakers use in constructing the social actions in interactions. Therefore, it is important to collect um, ethnographic data in order to understand not only how translanguaging is employed, but also why translanguaging is used in specific moments of the classroom interactions, which is not accessible through a description of interactional sequence alone. And that is why I combine it with um, interpretive phenomenological analysis. So this is a method that actually comes from health science. And it also adopts an emic approach or participant relevant approach in order to understand the participants uh, lifted experience. It involves a dual interpretation process called double hermeneutic. In other words, it requires the researchers to try to make sense of the participants trying to make sense of their world. So by, by doing so, you are allowing, uh, we are allowing researchers to investigate how the participants make sense of their pedagogical practices at particular moments uh, in the interaction. The second hermeneutic, as I mentioned about, uh, you know, how the researchers try to make sense of the participants uh, making sense of the experience, also encourages researchers to connect the theoretical concepts from outside the data to explain the psychological phenomenon. So it also encourages us to adopt an ethic approach to enrich the image analysis of the participants' lifted experience. But both research methods, they have the commonality is that when you start doing the analysis, analysis you, you first draw on the IMIC approach. So multimodal conversation analysis focusing on how translanguaging practices are constructed by speakers. And IPA focuses on how speakers make sense of their translanguaging practices. If you want to know more about the method, I recently wrote a book about this, and um, you can actually ask the library to purchase it. So the link is here. So now I will provide 
uh, serve uh, one example. So in the study, uh, we analyzed three representative classroom extracts, which illustrate how the teacher create a translanguaging space that was inclusive of diverse linguistic and cultural knowledge. In this presentation, I want to focus on the third example, which is engaging in embodied enactment and co-learning through translanguaging with students. So in this extract, we can see that the teacher is constructing embodied enactment, which is mobilizing diverse uh, physical movement to um, act a scene and act um, a hypothetical context to facilitate students' learning of a new Spanish word and also learn new knowledge about Disney movie from her students. So co-learning is another concept here. And co-learning is actually comes from um, the general education field, and it aims to promote equity in knowledge construction. It, 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 it requires teacher and students to learn from each other and engage in joint construction of knowledge. So in other words, it's not just about the teacher teaching new knowledge to the students. It is the students also play a role as a teacher to teach new knowledge to the te uh, back to the teacher. So he, by doing so, you are really challenging the power relationship between the so-called expert and the novice, and it denies the privileging of one line, one knowledge over another. So now I will play um, a short video that we, you know uh, that is comes from that comes from this abstract. Depending on your Wi-Fi or internet connection, you may not hear it clearly, or may not, or the verbal or non-verbal actions may not synchronize. But that's okay. My goal here is really allowing you to get a general sense of what's going on. Um, in the social in the classroom interaction explain how the translanguaging practices here are constructed so as you can see when the teacher requests students to keep quiet she utters a spanish word silencio with an elongated extension on the last syllable and places her index fingers um, on her lips um, in order to signal the need for students to be quiet and after a short pause, the teacher invites students to guess the meaning of silencio, as you can see in line one. It is evident that the teacher uses the request to create a learning opportunity for students to gain a more in-depth understanding of the usage of the Spanish word that they are not familiar with. In line seven, student three offers the answer it says quiet to, uh, to the teacher, which leads to a positive acknowledgement from, from the teacher. She then continues with her turn and attempts to make a connection between the word uh, silencio and a movie that students are familiar with. Specifically, Miss T uh, places both hands in parallel and extending her thumbs and pinky fingers while moving her hands to and fro, as we can see in figure 15. So we actually asked the teacher about the action that she's doing, and she was explaining to us that this is such an enactment of the gesture. It's inspired by the American Sign Language, which means me too, or you and me both. So it was the sign that she often used to get the student's attention. So here we can see that the teacher strategically deploys this gesture to signal to the students that this movie is well known to both herself and also to her students. In line 15, the teacher raised her arm and danced in motion, as we can see in figure um, 16, to give hints to all students. Concurrently, the teacher adopts a character viewpoint by, uh, by imagining herself as a character in the movie, as indicated by uh, the teacher's embodied enactment of the character's dance movement. Subsequently, the student, student four actually yells out uh, Silencio Bruno in line 19, which is the same response given by the other student in line 11. But in line 21, um, Ms. T provides some feedback by first saying, yeah, 
uh, uttering a yeah token to acknowledge the response, but it also invites the students to be more specific in their response, but what movie? So this results in a loud response, which is um, uttered by a whole group of students uh, and canto as they uttered in line 23. It is then noticeable that Ms. T switched from an instructional frame to an imaginative frame as she adopts a character viewpoint by imitating the voice of Obato, which is one of the main characters in the Disney movie. As we can see that in line 25, she was uttering uh, one of the classic dialogues in a loud voice. Such an enactment is accomplished by her um, hand gesture in line 8, as, as you can see in figure 18, which hypothetically imagines herself as Abaco saying Silencio Bruno loudly to Luca. But we notice that there is no student responding to stu a teacher's question in line 27. Then the teacher switched back to an imagining frame as she yells out, quiet Bruno, um, and place her index finger on her lips. In order to enable students to visually imagine how um, uh, Alberto will utter such a well-known line to Luca in English. So you can see that the teacher's gestural movement also gives hints to students that silencio in Spanish means quiet and silence. But nevertheless, we can see that a student too actually step in and repairs the teacher's um, explanation as he points out that the name of the Disney movie should be Luca instead of Encanto. The student's tour's repair is also recognized by student four as he utters yeah in line 35, which indica indicates his um, agreement with student two. So the teacher at first um, display her confu confusion as she uttered silencio, but she then utters a change of state token, oh, and apologize to her students. You're right, I'm so sorry. So such a change of understanding is further reflected in the teacher's explicit acknowledgement of the movie and her attempts to connect the movie with the popular uh, movie quote. It is from Luca Silencio Bruno, as you can see in line 40. And in response to the teacher's clever, clever, clarification, the students sing the lyrics in rhythm in unison, uttered in a very happy voice. It is, so this shows that the students are translanguaging as they were appropriating the popular movie quote and perform it musically in a new interactional context in order to reinforce that the popular line comes from a song that is performed in the movie. So such a response is actually performed in a very creative manner that leads to the teacher's uptake of the knowledge. So we can see this teacher's verbal acknowledgement in, in line uh, 49 and also 51. And that also leads to the same translanguaging practice performed by the students in line uh, 53. The students are singing aloud the popular quote in, in, in rhythm, um, which contributes to the creation of a playful classroom atmosphere. So I played this particular extract back to the teacher uh, during the video stimulated recall interview. And the teacher, she was explaining that she see herself as a, as a lifelong learner. And such a belief encouraged her to constantly learn new knowledge and receive feedback in order to improve her teaching. She also emphasized that different people had various strengths and weaknesses. Particularly, she was saying that we make mistakes, we are human, we learn from them. I always tell my kids the same thing, like you know, embrace anything that you are doing. So here you can see that the teacher, she has a positive attitude, like she's very willing to learn from her student. It is because of such an attitude that enables her to create a translanguaging space for co-learning. Towards the end of the interview, um, 
my I was so interested to know why the teacher is so keen to introduce translanguaging in her own classroom. This is sort of like a long quote, but I want to point out the important um, parts of it to, to you all. So it, it was first saying that it's upsetting to see all these sh school shootings happening. And I feel like for me, it is, you know, it could be so simple as just making sure that our classrooms are safe and comfortable and we are providing a safe space for our students. So here she was referring to the recent gunshots, a uh, shots that was ha that happened in Texas. There are um, 19 children uh, got killed in the uh, elementary school. She moves on and she was saying that, and I feel like it can start off here, like starting off that they feel accepted and they feel loved and that they feel appreciated in our classrooms. And in, in, it can be with something as simple as learning about other cultures around them, other languages around them. And I'm and I and I mean it sounds so silly when I feel like when I always say these things, but I'm so passionate about what I do and I feel like I want to make a difference. And I feel like it starts off with, you know, the students in your classroom. We always say like the future of the world is in my classroom today. And that's really how I feel. I mean, it's 18 kids, um, but who knows where they will lead in the future? Who knows if there will be precedent? So for me, it's really just making a difference in their lives, even if it's something so simple. So for her, it's about creating a classroom of acceptance and understanding that everybody is, is diverse. Everybody is unique. It can be wheelchairs, it can be glasses, it can be something that we don't really realize in the moments of, you know, we are different. But we all come together, we all build a classroom community, and we have to accept others, even if they are different than us. So you can see that the teacher, she really has a very strong uh, pedagogical philosophy. She's so keen to promote social justice in her own classroom. And that is something that I think we can educate, uh, that we can do in order to educate our student teachers. In terms of theoretical contribution, this study really fills in the research gap in the field of applied linguistics, since there is a lack of studies that provides a fine graded account on how teachers use translanguaging to enable meaning making and knowledge uh, construction in English as a first language, which only consists of first language English students. And most of the research in the field really focusing on the construction of translanguaging practices in multilingual classrooms or English as a medium instruction classroom or CLIL, content and language integrated classroom. But investigating translanguaging practices in L1 in L1 classroom is so significant because it really provides us with new insights into the ways how teacher can tap on translanguaging to ex expand the students' communicative repertoire and engage and encourage students to appreciate linguistic and cultural diversity. It is argued that it's not only the multilinguals who need to enhance their, their communicative repertoire. I argue that it's all students, including native L1 speakers, need to develop their capacity in making use of the best available resources and knowledge for achieving specific communicative goals in social interactions. Such an idea actually aligns with um, what Jennifer Jenkins has been um, advocating in her own research focusing on English as a lingua franca. So this study demonstrates the, the willingness of the teacher to create a translanguaging space in the English as a first language classroom, and such a space has a transform transformative effect on students' learning because it transforms the ways in which students feel, uh, understand languages as a resource for communication. In terms of pedagogical implication, I think I briefly mentioned about, you know, it is the teacher's understanding of translanguaging that enable her to create that space. And it shows that it can be created for all students to support native English speaking students learning. 
and it is also shaped by her own translanguaging knowledge that she gained from her teacher education course. If you're interested in, uh, in the full findings, you can look at the paper that was published in Applied Linguistics. The second example that I want to give is, the, is from an ESL classroom in Hong Kong. In my research, I was so interested to see um, how students in a primary ESL classroom can mobilize diverse resources to demonstrate their conceptual understanding of the target language during classroom interaction. So research in translanguaging ha has been focusing on um, you know, what teachers can do to enable students learning. Um, in this particular study, I want to see how, the how students actually demonstrate their conceptual understanding to the teacher. So the study is really to gather analysis of the students' um, uh, use of resources in order to ex expedicate their second language developmental progress. In this school, it's a Finnish primary school <coughs> in Hong Kong. Student uh, and it, it and uh, there are lots of ethnic minority student uh, students in that particular area with low social economic status. There are fifty percent of the students from. Uh, who are considered as ethnic minority students and half of the students are Chinese students. Um, this English is predominantly used as the language of instruction when teaching second language English in the year two class. This is normal because if you think about it, um, the teacher and the students come from diverse linguistic background. They do not share a common first language. So that is why English is predominantly used as the language of instruction, because this will ensure that all students can comprehend the lesson content. So you can see that the classroom um, in, um, consists of 26 students with different national backgrounds. And um, they are ranged from seven to eight years old. And all of them have been reside, have been living in Hong Kong for at least seven years. The teacher herself, she has a four year teaching experience and her, she also see herself as an ethnic minority, uh, even though she, she spent majority, majority of her life in Hong Kong. Um, she is a Chinese Indonesian. She attended international school for all for her childhood, early childhood primary and secondary education and received EMI education for her university degrees. In this particular um, presentation, I want to focus on the second example, which is the students were using body movements to demonstrate their conceptual understanding of action verbs. So again, I will play the video. The teacher is trying to uh, invite students to explain the difference between jumping and hopping. It is also noticeable that the teacher provides GIFs um, next to the action verbs on the screen. As you can see in line one to seven, the teacher invites students to, con to consider the difference between these two verbs and, and the teacher nominates student one to explain the difference in line five. However, the student, um, interestingly, does not explain the difference uh, verbally. The student was using his body movement um, to show the difference between hopping and jumping. In line number nine, student one, first utters hop is, and then he performs a light jump physically as he utters the word like concurrently in line 11. So here it is evident that student one taps on both linguistic and multimodal resources, English utterance and physical movement to demonstrate his understanding of hopping. Furthermore, student one adaptation of the physical action depicted in the GIF on the screen can be also be seen as a manifestation of translanguaging. This process allows student one to demonstrate his understanding and pers uh, personalize the action to make it his own. After the teacher utters a minimal token aha in line 12 to acknowledge student one's action, student one utters like this in a soft voice in order to complete the sentence that he constructed in line nine and 11. 
The teacher then positively acknowledged student one's utterance and physical action in line 16, and she was inviting student one to explain the meaning of hopping once again to all students in the class in order to uh, provide a physical illustration of the, of the word hopping. It is noticeable that both um, line, uh, both student one and also uh, student nine, they were using their body movement to demonstrate the action of hopping as we can see in figure um, six, as they perform a light jump in their feet. Even though student nine is not nominated by the teacher to do the explanation, student nine's uh, initiative in enacting the physical action of hopping also demonstrates his understanding of the meaning of the word. After um, the teacher acknowledges student one's and student nine's use of body movement, the teacher initiates another question. And how about jumping? Um, during the 1.3 uh, second, um, we can see that stu both student one and nine respond to the teacher's question by springing off the ground with their use of their feet, as we can see in figure seven. Such a multimodal action displays the understanding of the meaning of jumping. So after the, uh, the student one's and student nine's physical uh, movement, the teacher continues to use English to summarize the difference between jumping and hopping by explaining that, that their body is a lot straighter when you're jumping and hopping is a little bit is a little lower. Concurrently, you can see that the teacher bends down her knees and hop once in line 35. Um, this moment also demonstrates how the teacher adopts the student's physical movement of hopping in order to allow all students in the class to visualize the contextual meaning of the word. So here we can see that it is evident uh, the students were able to demonstrate the understanding of the vocabulary items through the use of multimodal translanguaging. And it is, we can also see it is a process of making physical movements one's own. And that is a form of translanguaging where participants are mobilizing diverse resources to convey particular meanings appropriately and also spontaneously in a specific interactional moment. So again, I play this particular clip to this teacher and um, she was explaining her pedagogical goal uh, behind, behind it. She believes in the value of allowing students to utilize multimodal actions to showcase their conceptual understanding of action words. This active involvement aligns perfectly with the objective of learning action words by doing so, means by doing so, students not only demonstrate their comprehension, but they are also actively applying their knowledge. So I argue that the teacher highlights um, this stands in contrast to passive learning, where students might simply sit without actively expressing their understanding. This highlights the significance of using body movements as a form of multimodal translanguaging that can offer valuable insights for assessing students' understanding. So in terms of theoretical contribution, I want to point out that um, how students' achievement of conceptual understanding of second language knowledge can be an embodied activity, indicating that translanguaging can work as a window to understand the, co the current state of the student's uh, knowledge in the learning process. In particular, I've also demonstrated how um, multimodal conversation analysis as a method can allow us as researchers to trace the students' change of understandings of specific second language knowledge. And students' second language development, of course, may not always be publicly observable during the classroom, observa uh, during the classroom interaction. Um, but that is an issue that is not only unique to this study. And it is a challenge that is faced by second language acquisition research in general, because fully examining the transition and progress of students' second language development, um, it's 
um, virtually impossible because it can take place outside of the classroom and it may also occur internally within the learners without explicit external manifest, uh, manifestation. But nevertheless, nevertheless, focusing on one particular uh, specific classroom uh, and limited number of students can allow us re as researchers to uncover the complexity of classroom talk and how it contributes to students' uptake of particular a second language knowledge. So just to summarize, all in all, we need to recognize that a multilingual classroom is a translanguaging space, which enables students to bring in diverse funds of knowledge in order to engage in real world meaning making and transform ways they view each other's uh, translanguaging practices and also their subjectivities. Um, the aim of multilingual education is not to replace the students' multiple resources with school-recognized named language. Rather, it aims to maximize students' multilingual potential in creating new knowledge. Methodology, uh, in terms of methodological implication, I've demonstrated the importance of understanding how and why translanguaging is employed in specific moments of the interaction. And um, I argue that the combination of MCA and IP allow us to do so. So in terms of pedagogical implication, it suggests that all teachers um, uh, to gain knowledge of translanguaging in order to move beyond understanding translanguaging as a scaffold, but also as a way to develop students' uh, emotional well-being and identities as citizens in this multilingual and multicultural world. It also, um, this, of course, the studies also provide how teachers can bring in diverse funds of knowledge into the teaching, and potentially they will need to demonstrate, they will need to develop the understanding of translanguaging as an empowering tool for promoting linguistic diversity in second language classroom, in content and language integrated classroom, and also English as the medium of instruction classroom. So this prompts policymakers to recognize translanguaging as a, as a um, theory of language and also as a pedagogy um, to enhance our students' uh, learning experience. So this is just a methodological model. As I mentioned, um, when we create a translanguaging space, we have to tap on our linguistic and multimodal knowledge. But there are different, um, there are other sociocultural factors or meaning-making resources that shape our translanguaging practices. For example, situation transcending practice. That means connecting the present teaching and learning situation with past knowledge and past experience. We teachers also need to tap on their pedagogical knowledge, their content knowledge, and finally, multilingual identity. How they see themselves as a multilingual, um, that will be very important. If they don't see themselves as multilingual or they don't really recognize multilingualism as a norm, then it's really difficult to encourage them to mobilize translanguaging in classrooms. So this is the conceptual model that can potentially allow teachers to plan their translanguaging practices or adapt it uh, flexibly to suit their own teaching context. Uh, just to quickly summarize, in terms of future directions for research on multilingual education, I think re future research uh, would benefit from exploring the impact of multilingual instruction on students' second language learning and content subject learning, their creativity and criticality, and also their emotional well-being, such as foreign language anxiety and foreign language enjoyment. So at the uh, recently, I received the, a, a, a large research grant from the Hong Kong Research Grant Council to look at the affordances of creating a translanguaging space to reduce the ethnic minority students' foreign language anxiety when they learn Chinese as a second language. So I think that will be something that we can uh, continue to work on in order to move the field forward. So that is really to, at the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please ask. I, I'm more than happy to address them. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Kevin, for your uh, very informative uh, talk. 
So I think, uh, so we, we start a little bit late, about five, six minutes late. So uh, we we can, you know, postpone our, you know, the time to close mm. the, the lecture. Uh, okay, so uh, dear audience, if you have questions, please let us know. Is there anything in the chat room? Okay, so Marella, may I uh, invite you to share your question to Dr. Tai? All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Marella from the Philippines, and thank you, Dr. Tai, for your presentation. I learned a lot, and there was really a lot of um, food for thought. So my particular question has to do with what you said about the need to integrate um, translanguaging into the curricula of teachers. And I was wondering, since translanguaging is a very uh, recent and developing concept, and as you said, it can be seen as a theory of how language is understood, also a pedagogical practice, and also a methodological practice. Um, I see translanguaging as something that is uh, ambiguous in a sense that it can be multimodal, it can be linguistic, it can be social linguistic. But I do wonder uh, this strength of translanguaging, it, can it also be a hurdle in terms of trying to make uh, new teachers understand exactly what translanguaging is? If it, can be applied and be understood in so many ways. So maybe my main question is like, what are the main sort of starting points uh, for a beginning teacher to be able to understand what translanguaging is before sort of looking at the broader um, implications? So I said a lot, I don't know if that makes sense, but thank you. Yes, that is a, actually a very, very good question. Um, I think it's because um, I, I don't, I'm not a teacher educator, but um, if you look at Ophelia Garcia's work, um, you know, she was based in New York, they develop uh, like a protocol in terms of what are the translanguaging practices that pre-service teachers can implement. So for example, in a multilingual, uh, in a classroom that has lots of students with linguistically, with linguistic and culturally diverse backgrounds, perhaps teachers can, Think about create um more, uh, using multilingual posters, um to honor the students' linguistic repertoire. They may also think about including um student uh, students L one um translation in worksheets, for example. So that will be one way of um, acknowledging that um you know their linguistic resources is the L one is is not um. It's not a limitation. It's one way of helping students to understand the content. But I also need to point out that uh, some teachers may think that translanguaging means just mobilize diverse resources. Um, that's re that's it. What we want to argue is that the use of translanguaging has to be strategic. So it has to fulfill your specific pedagogical goal. Um, so it's not about, okay, in in English classroom. So if you can translanguage, you can just speak in Cantonese 80% of the time. That's not what we were trying to argue. It depends on, it really depends on the student's ability. If students are really struggling, we, you have to think about using translanguaging as a resource to help students to understand the knowledge. Then the students can move forward to learn the second language. That's what we have been um, advocating. But yes, there are several strategies that are available on the on the internet. If you if you want, I can also send you the PDF. So it's publicly available. But the, the but there are some starting points that teachers can try to try to um try to try to implement in their classrooms. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much um, for your nice question, Marella. And we have a question from Michael. Michael, would you like to speak? Okay, so maybe I ask for Michael. Okay, okay. Uh, so I, <laughs> Michael mentioned that Dr. Tai, the common policy or conception of in uh, Southeast Asia in the BMA classes should be only should you only use English. Translanguaging is deemed unacceptable or even a threat to EMA EMI for the mastery of English language. What is your opinion? 
Yes, yeah, so I have actually uh, done a lot of work looking at translanguaging practices in EMI context. And um, in my own work, I was collecting naturally occurring data. In other words, I didn't ask teacher to use birth language or use particular multimodal resources. I just asked the teacher to just do the teaching as they normally do. So that's what naturally occurring data means. And it, it shows that actually teacher, they, they mobilize um, L1 or, and different uh, multimodal resources very strategically to fulfill their specific pedagogical goals. So you can see that actually, um, if the teachers, they understand the English only policy, but they are challenging the policy when they are carry out, when they're doing the actual teaching. So that's the dilemma. That is something that policymakers need to consider even when you are introducing the English only policy, but teachers are not following it because it doesn't work. So I think think of an example when you have if you have to le learn French, for example, and uh, you and the teacher only relies on French to do all the explanation. Do you think you will understand the content? Um, I think you know ultimately to you will expect the teacher to use some English to do some scaffolding. So it's the same situation in EMI classroom where students are asked to and also teachers are asked to learn and also teach the second line uh, teach the content such as math and history through a second language and the academic language there is very different from everyday life language. The English language curriculum is not supporting students to learn academic subjects. It's two different curricula and the language is completely different. So ultimately, translanguaging will play a role in helping students to understand the content. Once they understand the content, then they can move on to, to learn the academic uh, English, um, uh, academic English and also improve their academic English proficiency. Do you see what I mean? So I think ultimately it is the policy that needs to change um, rather than um, find ways to follow or conform with the English only policy. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for your uh, nice explanation. So uh, I think uh, I saw a question from Haiti. Okay. So Haiti, would you like to ask the question yourself? Okay. okay, it's not here. So maybe also by me. Oh, okay. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your insight for sharing, Dr. Tai. Today, our topic is on translanguaging for social justice. Would you please see the relationship between translanguaging, critical language awareness, decolonization, and social justice? What are different uh, focuses when we are researchers? Uh, we, uh, when we as researchers choose among these lenses? Wow. Mm. I know it's a it's a very tough question. So I need to dec I need to um perhaps say something um about my background. So I was trained as a conversation analyst. If you adopt um concepts such as critical language awareness or decolonization, that is you are aligning yourself with um critical apply linguistics, critical ethnography or critical discourse analysis. In my own research, when I argue the combination of multimodal conversation analysis with IPA, I did mention that we can include that critical aspect into our analysis in order to capture how different sociocultural factors play a role in shaping translanguaging practices. But for decolonization it's about you know how depending on the teaching materials whether um, it, your goal is to um, remove that native speaker norm or remove that white um, whiteness uh, or you know white British that kind of ideology in ELT textbook for example so I think that kind of analysis is it's another paradigm. So if you're interested, you can look at um, Nelson Flores and also Jonathan Ross's work on uh, racial, racial linguistic ideology. So I briefly mentioned that in my talk as well, but they are all connected because ultimately for decolonization, um, promoting critical language awareness, all these are promoting social justice and translate the ultimate goal for translanguaging is to promote equity and social justice. So they are 
you know, they are closely related. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, you know, just to clarify, I think Haiti and, you know, um, Michael are still with us, but they are either on road or, you know, okay, <laughs> or, or they are in the public space. So thank you for your questions. Uh, okay, we have a question. Uh, probably we couldn't accommodate too many. Uh, so maybe another two questions. So, um, ha, Harjuli, uh, excuse mm. my pronunciation, Harjuli, do you want to ask your question to, to Kevin yourself? Yes, actually. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm from Indonesia, Harjuli. Actually, I'm also right now pursuing my doctoral degree in linguistic. Uh, I'm curious about translanguaging. And also, I use your methodology of using MCA and IPA. Actually, I still learn more how to use this methodology to analyze my data. Uh, would you please share uh, more how to use this methodology and also actually how I can get your book? Because in Indonesia, actually, I, I, I didn't find uh, your book yet, maybe not published in Indonesia. Thank you, Professor. In terms of the explanation, um, I brief, I did explain that in my present in the presentation in terms of how do do methods can come can come together. As you can see, it's the classroom data and triangulated with the video stimulated recall interviews. Uh, but of course, it can also be triangulated with other forms of data, for example, field notes and also um other kinds of informal interviews. But the goal is to combine the classroom data with reflective interviews, how the participants re reflect on their own use of language. Um, so it's called meta-languaging data. Um, I, if you can send me your send me an email, I can send you the ebook. So that will that will that that's fine. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm so great. Glad. Thank you. Uh, Julie, I'm so glad for you. You have the right resource for your own study. Okay, Thank so, you. <laughs> okay, Sa uh, excuse me again, Saida. Um, yeah, would, would you like to ask the question yourself? I think the question is quite straightforward. Speaking uh, skills, yeah. Yeah, so how to. Uh, encourage students to use translanguaging for uh, better speaking skills, Kevin. Yeah, that's tough. Um, uh, I think I it depends on what you mean by speaking skills. So, I mean, if you talk about communication in everyday life, naturally, translanguaging will be the norm because research conducted by uh, Jennifer Jenkins, you know, and scholars from Southampton working on global Englishes and English as a language franca has shown that, you know, intercultural communication is very variable and dynamic. Um, even so-called using English only, but the variety of Englishes, the accents can be very diverse. The use of words, ways of speaking are very different. So translanguaging not will be a norm in intercultural communication. If you are talking about speaking tests um, in IELTS, for example, um, yes, of course that kind of exam, that kind of situation has to be monolingual because the goal is to assess your English language proficiency. But translanguaging can be a process, like while you're developing your skills in speaking, that can be one way to um, develop your speaking proficiency. And naturally, you would develop your, your skill in using English only in communication. So I think it's, it is the classroom instruction that can help you uh, to develop that skill. Um, so it really depends on the teacher's pedagogy. In, in developing students' um, second language proficiency and also their different um, exposure to English outside of the classroom. So it's not, it's not just translanguaging alone. Great answer. So uh, due to 
uh, time limits, I think. Uh, how about we just accommodate the last question? Yes, I'm, okay. I'm sincerely apologize for the question not be addressed. So, uh, Sher uh, Sherry Xiang Yu, right? Would you like to ask the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So I can also open my video. Uh, hello, Dr. Tai. So I've actually contacted you through email um, because I, throughout my reading, I found less attention is paid to students' perspective of translanguaging practices and their attitudes. So I wonder if we look at the students uh, in the tertiary level. Uh, just now you mentioned about their emotional well-being. I would like to know what is, you think is very appropriate to investigate their emotional well-being or what is kind of potential data source that we collect uh, to explore their maybe foreign language anxiety or enjoyment uh, throughout their learning in higher education. Mm. I think when we have to look at um, emotional well-being, such as um, foreign language enjoyment, foreign language anxiety, um, foreign language boredom, you have to do mixed method research. So you have to, there are lots of research looks at, adopt quantitative paradigm to look at foreign language emotions. And, you know, from a translanguaging perspective, we have been arguing that it can help students to develop their multilingual identity, um, their content and language learning, and also it can potentially facilitate that, that uh, reduce their anxiety. You know, the whole goal of translanguaging is to facilitate learning. So in, if you want to investigate foreign language anxiety or enjoyment, you have to do mixed method study to triangulate the quantitative paradigm with the qualitative paradigm in, in translanguaging research. Okay, thank you so much. And yeah. uh, about the book, I actually inquired the Anaya Library to purchase that book, but they have not really applied my uh, application. So I wonder whether I can also like... Are you from Hong Kong, you? Uh, no, I'm from Anaya. I'm still the master's student in the... Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I will send... To, again, drop me an email and I can send the PDF to you. Pretty sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. I, I think I need to apologize, Alison, because this is probably the question we'll forward to um, uh, Kevin and uh, Bob Tai can answer you separately in emails. Uh, okay. So, yeah, now it's uh, 5.45. We're over with 15 minutes. and But uh, we all seem to have very happy one hour, you know, and 15 minutes. And uh, it's, again... Thank you so much for Kevin, you know, to give us this wonderful talk. And uh, we'll all learn a lot from you. And I hope, you know, we can have another chance to talk about translanguaging and your your new work. And yeah. thank you, everyone, for um, for your attendance. Okay, as a tradition, as I mentioned, you know, this is the, our NIE Bilingualism SIG special interest group. So I'm the chairperson. Uh, Sun He and uh, I'm a senior research scientist, you know, on early bilingualism and bilingual education in general. So uh, thank you for, very much for your attendance. And uh, I think after Kevin, we have another uh, seven great talks onward, you know. Hope you will come to join us another time and see you next time. And bye-bye and wish everyone a good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Oh.